the situation in Italy today. So first, I think I should caveat this by just saying that uh, obviously there are severe restrictions on, on access into Italy. Uh, so anything I know, any picture I've been able to put together uh, is based on kind of remote communications, contacts with people who are inside, and then also people who I've spoken with uh, in neighboring Turkey. But the situation, as I understand it, is that uh, Idlib now, it's the, it's kind of the, the last bastion of the opposition that has not been somehow besieged uh, or otherwise neutralized by foreign backers. Um, it's home to, uh, inclusive of kind of neighboring areas of uh, Aleppo, Hama, uh, it's home to more than two million people, uh, including roughly a million IDPs from elsewhere in the country uh, who are uh, extremely needy. I think that the, so there is, to some extent, there's some normal economic activity, but the province, to a large extent, it depends on international assistance, um, whether provided by state donors or, or various kind of charities, humanitarian organizations. Uh, in terms of military control, uh, the de-escalation has, has kind of taken hold in Idlib um, and, and halted some of the clashes at its periphery. But uh, control is roughly divided between uh, Ahrar Sham, uh, which is a, it's kind of an Islamist movement opposition faction that emerged from uh, a, a, a militant milieu uh, but has since hewed more closely to a, a kind of a populist revolutionary line. Uh, and then Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which is the latest iteration of Syrian al-Qaeda affiliate uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. Uh, as I understand it, uh, and this is something on which people people disagree, uh, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham is the, the kind of prime dominant actor. Uh, but both of these uh, both of these factions are are spread and intermingled throughout the province. Um, there are also a number of other factions uh, that are there, but they mostly just s kind of swim in the wake of one uh, or the other of these two factions. Um, but all of them from all factions are also bound up in kind of uh, regional or personal or uh, uh, familial ties uh, in a way that really complicates the picture. I think it would be hard for the Assad regime to take it. Uh, I mean, certainly the Assad regime, uh, its forces are not particularly uh, capable they're worn out, they're overstretched, uh, dependent to a large extent on, uh, I think, kind of air support from Russia. But also, I mean, Idlib has a, a number of local factors that would make this hard. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of fierce, uh, capable fighters who are now concentrated in Idlib. Um, there are, uh, there's a kind of a difficult mountainous terrain and there is a, a, a long border with Turkey uh, that can be used as, as a supply line. Uh, I think that regime intentions are difficult to divine, but at least one, one way that I've heard it though is that the, the regime essentially now views Idlib because of the concentration of jihadists in particular, it views Idlib as an international problem. And so it's waiting for international powers to kind of coalesce into a sort of consensus behind the regime and behind a regime uh, invasion of Idlib. Uh, and then it will, at that point, it will let, you know, uh, whether it's Russia or the United States or whoever, they will solve the regime's Idlib problem. Um, when it does happen, I think that Jabhat al-Nusra, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham is probably the best able to pivot from uh, or to pivot towards more guerrilla warfare, to resort to uh, to the mountains, to caves. Uh, I don't think that most of these other factions are capable of it just because of how they are, how local they are, and then how bound up they are in specific towns, 
and areas. Um, so I don't think that they'll be able to just kind of to pull back, to melt away, and then to leave the, the hometowns to which they're connected, these communities, uh, at the regime's mercy. On local services, so obviously, so the, the, the service picture in Idlib is complicated. Um, there's obviously, there's a, there's a lot of civilian actors. The, the province is primarily administered through kind of town and city level local councils. But armed actors have also intervened in this space. Uh, so I've written previously about the, uh, the Jaish al-Fatah Alliance uh, set up an administration of Idlib city. Uh, and then two other uh, uh, nearby towns. Also, Jebat the Nusra uh, had what was called uh, the Public Services Administration, which has now been rebranded as Hayat Tahrir Sham's uh, Civil Administration for Services. Uh, and then there is the Ahrar Sham backed uh, Services Administration Commission. Um, so, all of these kind of armed group linked or backed bodies have intervened in services in different ways and then for apparently for different motivations. Um, so and then so it looks like one of the main motivations then is to accrue um, well the stated motivation is to to rationalize and coordinate service provision in these areas. Um, address some of the, the dysfunction and shortcomings of some of the local councils, some of the ways that they haven't been connected or fit together. Um, but certainly I think there's also a dimension uh, of kind of attempting to accrue uh, local influence. Um, Ahrar and Nusra uh, have been locked since 2015 basically in an ongoing competition for influence and control in Idlib. Uh, and so that has migrated into the service space. Um, and it's something that we saw kind of most immediately uh, over the past month or so uh, when Ahrar and Nusra or Tahrir Hashem each cut off electricity from either parts of or the entirety of Idlib uh, over a dispute over control of a dispute over control of a, a, a of an institution to uh, to control electricity provision to the province uh, and over the pricing per ampere. Um, so even as kind of the, the the fronts have calmed down, then this is the the competition between these two factions has just migrated into this other space. Mm -hmm.